Hello. Uh, hello, Brudenell TV. I hope this is coming over uh, live and clear. Um, hello, YouTube land, and hello, everyone that's tuned in to hear tonight's uh, very, very special guest. Um, when people talk about music in Manchester, they think of people like Tony Wilson and Alan Wise. Uh, in Liverpool, it will be Roger Eagle who promoted Eric's. Um, in Leeds, really, the man that's really towered over the Leeds music scene and live music in Leeds for, what, 43 years now, um, is our special guest, John Keenan. Um, the venues he's put, he's put gigs on in and around this city is a list literally as long as your arm, but it includes places like the Grand Theatre, the Polytechnic, which is now the Beckett University, the other university, the F Club, which was the legendary punk and new wave venue at, at Brannigan's, um, the Warehouse, the Queen's Hall, where the Future Armour Festivals were, uh, in, and in many further afield, everywhere from Otley Conks to Harrogate Baths. Um, in that time, he's brought acts to Leeds. It's a real who's who. The Police, U2, Human League, Joy Division, New Order, Radiohead, Coldplay, Nirvana, Oasis, Blur, Muse, Manic Street Preachers, Public Image Limited, Pulp and Wire and the B-52s, and that's just the first ten a dozen. There are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of legendary bands. Uh, well, not all legendary, obviously, but thousands of bands <laughs> that, that John has brought to Leeds. Actually, a lot of them are legendary now, uh, even if they weren't so, so at the time. Um and he's really nurtured the music scene itself in the town. He is, you know, he was the person who put soft sell on, who put the wedding present on, could pale saints, uh, Runston Parva, who late, later became Kaiser Chiefs. Pretty much every band uh, that has started out playing music in Leeds has been put on by John Keenan. Uh, the legendary lights of Gang of Four and Sisters of Mercy, Mercy, and they're not so legendary bands, but it, it all makes up part of the tapestry of Leeds music and for the next hour uh, we're going to hear about that extraordinary career and extraordinary life really. Good evening John. Good evening. I'm here wide awake. <laughs> How's life, how are you How are you finding life in lockdown because you're not able to promote which I would imagine is the first time you've not been promoting for 43 years. It, it's kind of, I miss the urgency, there's no, uh, there's a, basically I live in two time zones. I live in today, I'm booking the bands. And then six months down the line, I'm promoting the bands. So it's kind of like I'm living in today and living in the future as well. And I like that, you know. Uh, but also I like to have targets. I like mm -hmm. when I wake up in the morning, I think, uh, or in the afternoon sometimes, but <laughs> I think that, uh, whoa, you know, I've got, I've got to do this today. I've got to get there. And in lockdown, uh, there's nothing. There's no agency for anything. And I kind of miss that little buzz. I know what you. I know what you mean. I'm the same with gigs and gig reviewing. And I kind of miss that feeling of going to the gig, reviewing the gig, getting up in the morning, filing it, and then you think, where's the next one? And, yeah, a similar feeling. But um, you've been doing that a lot longer than I've been writing about music, which some people would say is a flipping miracle because I have been. I feel like I've been doing this forever. Um, but it all started for me because of your gigs. And I want to take you back really right to the beginnings, really. You know, you you, you, you had quite a, a nomadic childhood. You know, you were, you were born in St. Helens, but then you lived all over the place, didn't you, in the first few years? Well, my, my dad uh, was a teacher, and the first few years, he uh, uh, he was learning to be a teacher, you know. So uh, we were living uh, in both of my grandparents' terrace houses. We come from a very working-class background, you know. They were both both lived in uh, two-bedroom terrace houses with a toilet outside, and. Uh, my mother's mum brought up eight kids in that environment and but so we couldn't sort of live with them and so we uh, for a while we lived in a caravan in a field near Caution Court in Bath and uh, then we moved to a cottage a lead miners cottage in Wales because my dad got a job uh, for a, a Liverpool Education Authority at Colum uh, in near Mould in North Wales, and uh, so yeah, we did move around a lot when I was little. And a lot of that time, though, I was going back and forth to my uh, grandparents' 
uh, in the, the holidays and uh, various other reasons while my mum was having a, a baby, you know. So I was back and forth uh, over the Mersey a lot. Uh, in the early days. Did you take the ferry across the Mersey? Yeah. <laughs> Royal Iris. Yeah, my granddad, I used to get a bus to Birkenhead. Uh, and I, 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 you know, when I was a little bit older, I took my, my brother or, or and, and my sister, who was uh, about five years younger than me, and we'd get on the Royal Irish by ourselves, and my granddad would meet us on the other side, and uh, then take us to St Helens. Um, the, uh, but my dad uh, got a job uh, at an approved school in Formby, St Vincent's, and uh, he. Uh, uh, he arranged for me to take a scholarship for like for the best Catholic school in the area, which is St Mary's College, and I took it and I got in. And uh, while I was there, in the sixth form was uh, John Burt, who became Director General of the BBC, and Vincent Nichols, who became a Cardinal and the Archbishop of Westminster, the top Catholic in in Britain. Wow! And I would. He'd love it if he got to be Pope, because then I could say I went to school with the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> but he went the religious way, I went the other way. I, I just sort of well, we, we, had, we had this fascinating conversation on Facebook about a year ago where you compared the experience of a gig and the climax of a gig, you know, the way that things build to this sort of climatic thing at the end. You compared that to Catholic Mass. And I wondered if that had left some kind of an impression on you where this whole idea of performance and that it builds to something, whether that had really subconsciously sowed the seed for what you then became, you know, your life, a promotion. When you're little, you're indoctrinated into going to church and uh, seeing this guy on an elevated platform and sometimes a choir and people singing and, uh, and it kind of instills into you. It's the same. You find that in, in a lot of big stars are either Catholics or Jewish, and you know they they have a similar thing. You know, it's like you 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 have to go every week and worship, and and mm. there's a guy there performing the ceremony, and you're 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 there going along with it. You know, as I got older, I used to go to church, but I was clocking the girls opposite and all that. I wasn't I, did, I wasn't I couldn't get interested in it. You know, I was just it was just a duty. Mm. But I think. It's kind of instilled in you, and and you, uh, and I carried that that through uh, to you know like the master of ceremonies. I, I consider myself a backroom boy. I make things happen, I make it all happen. But again, it, it is very similar to putting on a mask. Uh, and uh, you find that a lot of the big stars are. are were brought up as Roman Catholics or, or Jewish, you know, uh, a lot of them. Mm. Uh, you, you know, all that Manchester Sea New Order and all that, uh, a lot of them, were, you know, went to Catholic grammar school, Tony Wilson, Rob Britton, all of them. Mm. Uh, in, in, and especially in the Liverpool. And you know, got Bono and you two, obviously, probably the most famous Catholics in music. Um, who you promoted as well? I think one or two of them are. I don't. I don't think Bono is. I think Adam. Is I think most of them are, aren't they? I think. I think. The, I think there's even three of them. I think three of the four. Are, are, I'm not sure about whether it is. Maybe not. Maybe not Bono. No, not three of them are. Um, anyway, they they will crop up in this conversation again. I'm sure. Your your, your first promotion was at Southport Art College. You you, you ended up. You became the arts ensec. I think it was at, at Southport Art College. <laughs> How did that happen? I think it was by default. Uh, I think nobody else want, wanted it. <laughs> and and I don't know, they had a meeting, they had a students meeting. Mm. And because when, when I was at St. Mary's, we, we used to play rugby. And if we got rained up, we'd either go to the pictures or sometimes we'd go to the cabin and, and for the lunchtime session. And so I... I you a lot of people. Plus, uh, you, you know, my friend was Timon, uh, who, who actually got a deal with Apple Records, recorded with uh, Paul McCartney, and and he he was with the Moody Blues, and he taught Joe Strummer to play and live wow. with Joe Strummer. And yeah. I, 
I, I, uh, so I, I was connected to a fair amount of people. And I think because of that connection, they thought he knows a bit about music. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get him to book the bands. Yeah. So, you, start, you started off, I have to say, in pretty, uh, you know, at the top row. I mean, you, the, your first ever promotion was John Mayles Blues Breakers featuring Peter Green on guitar. The, the same Peter Green, of course who founded Fleetwood Mac, one of the legendary guitarists of British pop history. That's your first promotion, um, which I think lost you 20 quid. Incredible. Yeah, well, actually, uh, it was an arts ball, but then it was like a, a confrontation with uh, one of the students uh, on, on the committee and the caretaker over something trivial. And it ended up with the caretaker slapping the student, but the caretaker went to the headmaster and reported it as the student had attacked him and the headmaster banned the arts ball. So it's like, what have we got to do? So it was basically, I took it on and signed the contract. You know, thought, we'll do it anyway. So I went ahead with it. And uh, it, it was supposed to be uh, John Mayle with Eric Clapton, you know, when I signed it. Wow. And we were expecting Eric Clapton. And... Uh, uh, Peter Green turns up and it was like, who's he? You know, who's Peter Green? And uh, and I think Ainsley Dunbar from the Mojos was was drumming for him. And Ainsley went on to drum with the Mojos and bench of loads of other people. Yeah. But he was drumming for them. And uh, and uh, my next door neighbor, Max Lunt, is, he had a Mersey band called Crusaders. So got them to open. And I, I, I think it was. Uh, uh, I forget who was in the middle. Uh, it might have even have been the, the uh, uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't the Mojos, but it was a, a band similar to that, a, a mid-range. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and the, your second promotion, I think, was Pink Floyd. I don't think I ever knew this, and and I've known you for years, but I, I don't think I knew this. It's like what Pink Floyd? It it wasn't. Uh, really my promotion it was a, a, an official art, art school promotion but i right. helped them with it helped them set it up and do it yeah. and all that and i remember uh, uh you know standing at the back and uh watching the lighting guy and it was incredible because he he had these glass slides and he'd put a bit of oil on them and a bit of ink and all that put them in a magic lantern and, and it would heat it up and he'd get a, a uh, what you call it, a flame burner thing, you know, uh, on, on the projector, on the slide, to make it throb. And so it was, it was the first time anybody had ever seen anything like that. And then he got yeah. film, put a film in it, and the heat of the projector would burn the film, and the film would all disintegrate in front of you. That's wow. what I watch. You can do it now, health and safety. <laughs> like, you know, it's uh, amazing to watch. So I watched him at the back. And uh, they had uh, more speakers than anybody else, which is like about two aside. And everybody yeah. thought that, oh, wow, well, we've got two speakers aside. And, uh, you know, a lot of bass. So there's a lot of rumbling and there's a lot heavier sound than anybody previously experienced. So, uh, well, would great. you have possibly known at that time that they would become one of the most legendary bands in the history of British rock music? It was, as far as they were different. And... Mm. The next day, uh, they went. Uh, uh, they went to record see Emily play uh, the, after that gig. Wow. Uh, the the uh, you know I, I never got to see them again to promote them again. <laughs> they, once they made it, once they up there, they forget about people like me. Yeah. Well, I, 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 that's the that's the, one of the stories of promotion, isn't it? I suppose it's the same for music journalists. You know that most bands forget who wrote about them early on, and thankfully, most of them forget who slagged them off early on, which is I'm, I'm often a bit more grateful of. You know, it's like yeah, sorry about that, chaps. You know, when you're playing Wembley Stadium or whatever it is, you know. Um, so give, us, give us a leg up into the secret garden, and once in the secret garden, you're waiting for the ladder to come back over the wall, but it never does. Yeah, but the trouble is, if you go to the secret garden too long, you, you lose yourself in there. And sometimes it's nice well, on the ladder, you, know, you get a cup of tea and everything. Yeah. You had a 10-year gap then. I mean, that's not 1967, and really, you, 
you had this 10 year gap. Why, why was that? Why did you not promote or, or be involved in gigs again for so long? And then what, what kick started it again? Well, when that first gig, I was only 16. And, wow. uh, you know, I was very young. And, you know, in the meantime, in the 10 years, I, I met my wife and had two children and a, a third, actually, in 78. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I was busy trying to provide for, for family, you know, when I got to a point where I was more or less established, then I thought, like, I can experiment a bit. But it's, mm. it's a bit like, again, a religious an a analogy. It's a bit like having a calling, you know, mm. I was thinking about it, but this is what I wanted to do. I knew this is what I wanted to do. I enjoy uh, the complications of setting it up and it's like a chef baking a cake, you know, you, you, you yeah. know where all the ingredients are, you know, and you try and make it as tasty as possible. And hopefully you get a slice of the cake when it's baked, you know. It's, it's, uh, and you get to look at the cake and it's perfect, you know, form with the cherry on the top and everything. Before you can give a chef or several people the same ingredients and one or two will come up with something great. Uh, mm -hmm. The rest will make a mess of it. And basically, uh, you know, I've been doing it so long, it, it, it's kind of, you know, I know where all the ingredients are and how I can put them together. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just relying on other people to, uh, to supply me. That's the thing. What brought you to Leeds? Uh, train. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, because you worked you work for YTV, didn't you? But why Leeds? What brought you here? As, you know, well, I, went, I was uh, after college, like in the summer, I thought I've got to get a job straight away. So I worked at Marching and Snowgroves because I've been to art school as a window dresser, you know, doing the windows up and all that. And my mum saw an advert in the Daily Mirror for promotions managers wanted in Leeds, mm. you know, because I'd done a bit of promotions, so I'll get you. So they sent me off to Leeds. I didn't live with them at the time. I had a flat, but they, she thought, oh, this would be good for you. Sent them off in Leeds. It's Leeds. And uh, I got there. And the American promotions company was an encyclopedia company. You know, and they expected me to sell encyclopedias. So I stayed there a couple of months. And I met my wife there because she was a student as well doing, doing this. And I did get to be a field manager after about a month and instructing the others. Uh, but I thought, you know, I can't, I can't be doing this. And uh, I left with, with my wife and a few others and got a job as a commie chef in, uh, in the Vintage Steak Bar in the Marion Centre for a while. Uh, I, I, I could cook because, well, you know, from the age of about 14, I'd worked in, uh, in Southport in, in mm. the restaurants there, you know, helping the chefs down, you know, so I had a reasonable knowledge of uh, cooking food. And your, your first, your first why, why an, an analogy. Your, your first gig promotion in Leeds was Alan Price. How, how did yeah. that happen? It was at Al, Alan Price at the Grand Theatre. Yeah. Well, well, basically, I wanted to start off big. I thought I'll start at the top, and I had worked at the Grand, uh, mm. and that's how I got into YTV. I worked uh, for about eighteen months at the Grand as a, a stage hand and scenery painter and a lot. And uh, we used to, after the shows, we'd have a drink and sometimes we'd go to parties and the Bachelor's show was a long run over the Christmas. And uh, I got on well with Les Dawson. And when he started at YTV, he was doing the Les Dawson show. And he, you know, gave me a, a, a recommendation to that. And I got a job in wardrobe, uh, you know, doing costumes and stuff like that. And uh, like it was a small contract. And uh, I, I did jobs like unit assistant and uh, just general jobs, general contracts coming up. I trained for a bit as a as a, an editor, a trainee editor, film editor, and uh, you know I went to eight ATV after. But there were little bits in between. But yeah, uh, coming to the why did I start? I wanted to get Lou Reed, and so I phoned up Lou Reed's manager and. It was like he couldn't offer me this. You know, I tried for ELO, he couldn't offer me that. And he, he, he said, I can give you Alan Price. 
and I, I wasn't a big fan of Alan Price, but I thought it's a start. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I put him on, and I put my mate Simon Dog at the bottom of the bill. It was quite funny because uh, Alan Price audience, a lot of my friends were whitey, we went to, and he opened up and he, he had songs like Dog Dirt on His Shoes, it's the latest fashion, the latest thing to do, and Sick as a Dog and No One to Splash. And the worst one was, he's got you by the balls, you suck you dry. <laughs> Everybody's like aghast. But, you know, and then like a cabaret band, Limelight, whatever came on. And, but I thought it was really good there. And that was kind of like a punky thing to do. And uh, after that, I, you know, I did the heartbreak. After that, I did a few shows of Heartbreakers, Vibrators, and Kevin Ayers and people like that. You, you mentioned the punk thing. I mean, I, that's really when you, you know, you, you started promoting in Leeds at the same time as punk was, you know, I don't know if exploding around the country because we, you know, you hear that on BBC documentaries that you know it does sometimes feel like you know punk took over the world and drove all the superstars out of their castles with pitchforks. It wasn't really like that. I mean, in our school, in you know, in Leeds, we had about probably six punks. You know, um, but it felt there was a very visible presence in the in the town on a Saturday. You know, you would see punks milling around in the Marion Centre or in Virgin Records and outside Virgin Records and it was clearly there was a scene there waiting to happen and you just seemed to come along at the right time and recognise that and started booking those bands didn't you? I think XTC were one of the first bands you booked and you booked Splits very early on um, this was in, in in the Poly which was the, the very first F Club um, uh, which was your kind of your night I suppose your, you know, the F Club started off in the Poly yeah, at the time it, it, uh, I, I was promoting with, uh, well, I, I was booking the band with Graham Cardi uh, and uh, we called it Stars of Today. And basically, after the run of the poly, as you said, XTC, Slits and all that, after the run of the poly, uh, when the students are coming back, uh, the student committee says, well, you can't do any more gigs here. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, I had to find somewhere else. But we had such a good crowd and, you know, uh, you know, everybody got, they're all misfits, but they all, everybody got on with each other. Yeah. And I thought, how do we keep them all together? So I, I started up a club uh, where they could join for uh, a quid, but get 25 pence off each, each gig thereafter. And uh, it, it was called the F Club, basically the first letter I I put out, you know, for the idea of joining a club was let's get the F out of here. You know, it's uh, yeah, so it was like F the poly kind of thing. Well, you know, why, so. why, did, why did you get kicked out of the poly? Was it because you were putting on these sort of snotty, spiky haired punk group? Yeah, because it was punk and and they wanted it for themselves. It was a poly common room, you know, and, a right. and, all that. and they wanted yeah. it for themselves. I, I still had gigs on at the main room in the poly, you know, mm. I had you know, it was. Cox, the infamous Buzz Cox gig on there, the John Cooper Clark, and a few other things on it in the main room. In, in, in the, and uh, you know that was when I was doing the Ace Clubs, which we, which I found, which is like a slightly rundown cabaret club. And it mm. had a lot of stair dying doors and all that, but it was uh, being run by Maltese people. Maltese right. Gentlemen. Is it where, where that was in Woodhouse, wasn't it? The Ace of Clubs. Is, is yeah. it is the building still there or is it long gone? It was there for about 30 years. The thing is, it had I was only there a few months, and after the Christmas, it had a suspicious fire, mm. and the insurers wouldn't pay out. And the owners did a bunk somewhere, and it was uh, left for about 30 years. Wow. And they only put it down a few years ago. Amazing. Uh, the venue is a good little venue. Because in there you put in a you put on a lot of the um, the first gang of four and Mekons, um, and in fact I think the Susie and the Banshees played in there. You know, which is incredible now. You know, you think of the, the Susie and the Banshees and all these bands as legendary names playing this little rundown <laughs> club in in Woodhouse. You know, not, not bad inside. It had a uh, the, the back of the stage was one of the terrace houses alongside, and. Uh, it had a, a pneumatic stage that uh, like rose up for the dancers, you know, and it like covered most of the dance floor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes 
big advantage is that some would use the other part of the stage, which is quite high. Uh, I remember uh, the kill choice was Kevin Rowland's there, and there was a girl in the band, and she had like stocking, you know, fishnet stockings and all that. And there were guys like grabbing towards her, and she was like kicking them in the face with their stilettos. You know, yeah. one came back to me at the back, you know, his face all bleeding. Oh, look. I said, you shouldn't be trying to touch her, you know. I said, this is your own fault, you know. But it's quite funny watching that. And another one had X ray specs on and uh, polystyrene collapsed after about three, three songs, and we had to rush her into the dressing room at the back. And Falcon Stewart and manager was with her. And I just thought she was big. I think basically what it was, they only had about three or four songs. And, yeah. You know, it was one of their first gigs. Yeah. And, and uh, she was all right after that, you know, but yeah. It, it's, <laughs> It seems like you had a lot of foresight. You know, you put on bands at very formative stages in their careers, and you you really, really were tapped into that the punk and then the post punk scene, um, and gave a lot of those bands a platform. That they went on to be well, literally legendary bands. A lot of them. I mean, had you any idea that the importance of what of what you were putting on that it would be seen like that in years to come? You, I guess you can't have done. Or did you and think, wow, you know? Not, not the importance of it, but the, the only talent I have is is uh, being able to see the talent in others. Mm. And I was buying records. I used to go to Project Records and Airs. We used to get a lot of DJ copies and all that. And I'd hear something that nobody else knew about. And I'd think, well, these are really good. And then they'd make it, you know, like I got the first Eagles album. You know, Richie Woman, I thought, these are bloody good. And then, you know, they started uh, bringing out the Bland albums after, but I always liked the first few albums. You know, I think I got uh, Velvet Underground there and a few other things, you know, before the people latched onto them. So mm. I, I always had to think about being ahead of the curve, if you like. And, uh, mm. and, you know, basically I've used that promotion, but it doesn't do any good because you spot them. Uh, Mm. You give them all I got, but you, you don't benefit from it. I've put all these big names on, but you know, it's, it's not really doing me any good, but I've had a good time doing it. <laughs> that's that, that's half the battle, isn't it? Really, I mean, it's funny that that ticket that was just shown up there, the Bauhaus ticket, um, yeah. at the bottom it says special guests. I went to that gig, that's one of the first gigs. Uh, I ever went to, and that those special guests, uh, uh, Nick Cave and the birthday party, um, and in those days I used to go along because we, you know, we had very little money, and me and my mate Bruce, uh, we would go, you know, we'd get there very early. We wanted to see everything, so we'd see the the whole bill, you know, and bottom of that bill were, were Nick Cave's birthday party, who were absolutely incredible. Um, I remember them singing uh, the song "Zoo Music Girl." And Nick kind of grabbing this kid in the front row who had sort of like a jacket on, and he grabbed him by the lapels, you know, and he's shaking this kid by the lapel, saying, Wake up, express yourself, right in this kid's face, you know, probably scarred him for life. But I just thought, My God, this is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen, you know. But although, in fairness, I'd only seen about eight gigs or something, but it did blow my head off. And funny enough, years later, I did, I was lucky enough to interview Nick Cave, took along the ticket. And I have it somewhere in this very room, actually, signed by Nick Cave. So, uh, you know, it was it, 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 it's just one of many that you put on in those days. I mean, I, it's, I, mean, I've, I know I've told you this before, um, but you did, and I'm sure other people have said the same thing to you as well, but you, you did literally change my life. Um, you put on the Future Armour Festivals, which started in 1979 at the Queen's Hall in Leeds, which isn't there anymore. Um, it's kind of behind where Beebe's is now. Um, it was a car park for a long time, and now it's, I think it's office blocks or something, but um, it was the, the Queen's Hall on Swinegate where you put on this incredible festival called Future Armour, and this was in September 79. Um, billed as the world's first, uh, world's first science fiction music festival, um, which sounded very en enticing. Um, I'd, not, I'd, ne I'd never been to a gig in my life, um, and I saw that that was coming and I just, I was still at school and I, and I, on Saturdays I had a job at Asda at Holt Park. Um, 
and I really wanted to go to this gig. I couldn't afford to go for the two days. I could afford one day. And I wanted to see Johnny Rotten, who was on with Public Image Limited, headlining it. Um, and I had to beg the boss at Asda, Mr. Brooks, please let me finish early so I can go to this thing. And Because I, I normally finished at five, and I thought, well, if I finish at five, by the time I get down there, I'm going to miss half of it. I said, oh, please, Mr. Brooks, let me finish early. And it did let me finish a bit early, but not, not as early as I'd hoped. So I still missed quite a bit. Um, but I vividly remember watching orchestral manoeuvres in the dark and hearing this, what I now know to be electricity, the song Electricity, which at the time sounded like the, uh, pretty much like the Magic Roundabout theme coming from Mars. And they had this little Revox reel-to-reel -reel on stage and there were two people and I'm just thinking, what is this? You know, I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before on top of the pops or anything. Um, but then really one after another, every band really was just astonishing in different ways. There were a certain ratio. We were doing that kind of punk funk thing that's really, you know, become a really legendary thing now. Um, Cabaret Voltaire were electronic pioneers, synthesizer pioneers who were, kind of virtually got booed off. You know, I remember people, they just didn't know what to make of it. Um, Punishment of Luxury, who had uh, rubber gloves uh, which dangled down, which looked like a jellyfish, and which I thought was incredibly futuristic. Years later, I found out that it was just marigolds, you know, a pair of marigolds. But it looked really futuristic under the lights when you're 15. Um, and, and obviously, jo you know, Joy Division, which I think is still my favourite performance of all time. Um, I, I can literally remember being standing behind this kid and his shoulder sort of crashing into my chin like this every time the, the bass riff from Transmission hit. Um, you know, and at the, by the end of that set, you know, my, my dental work was absolutely knackered. Um, but I, I was, I don't think I was ever the same person again. I went to that festival as a kind of, you know, wannabe kiddie punk really in an iron on Sid Vicious t-shirt. Um, and slightly, um, that, that is me, I'm afraid. Um, in fact, if I don't get to the barber soon, I'm going to have the same flipping haircut as I had in 1979 at this rate. But um, yeah, that, that's me. That's me on the way into Future Armour, taking at uh, Woolworths on Brigate. That's my mate Bruce's arm, um, and we were about to go to Future Armour and have our heads, you know, removed and our lives changed really. And I think what really hit home was that music could be more than entertainment. You know, it was it could be darker and more powerful and more mysterious and unsettling than the stuff I'd seen on Top of the Pops. And really, that's where everything started for me. You know, years, 10 years later, I became a writer. But I think really the seed was sown at, at Future Armour. It, it just changed everything. And all those bands that you put on um, that day, lots of them went on to amazing, amazing things. Like Joy Division, you know, I spoke to Steve Morris, the drummer, the other week about that gig. And he was saying, well, you know, we'd, we'd never played anywhere like this. You know, they, they were used to little places like the, the F Club, actually, where you'd put them on. Um, so they were playing to, like, you know, 100 people. And then suddenly they're going, they're going to this massive place with this massive stage. Um, and they were terrified. But they delivered the performance of their lives and the rest is history. You know, the music press raved about them. And uh, a couple of weeks later, they wrote Love Shows. You know. um, so Future Armour really... Changed the lives of a lot of people there. And I had this conversation with loads of people that went there. But also the, the bands that played there, you know, a lot of them, it was their first massive exposure. And you look at that lineup now and it's just a real who's who, you know, of uh, great music, really. Where, you, where, where did you get the idea to, to put that on? Uh, basically, uh, my wife used to take the kids to see her mother who lived in Germany over the summer. So it was kind of like looking for something to do. And I thought, yeah, I'll put an event on. The thing about those events, I never had much time to, I did them in about less than two months. You know, mm. now we have got a plan. The, the, the next Leeds Festival, you know, uh, the day after the, first, the one's finished. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to put, I had a lot of the bands playing down the club. And I wanted to basically, I did it to give the local bands exposure because half of that bill were all bands from around the Leeds, way from Bradford area. And I wanted to get them and then put a few better known bands. But even, you know, bands like uh, OMD and Joy Division, they, they were only 100 quid bands, you know, they weren't, yeah. weren't money then. And, uh, 
uh, and but I paid, you know, I think I paid about three grand for public image limited because I, I figured that a festival is as big as the biggest event. That's got to be the draw. And mm. the middle ones will bring a, a, a few of the uh, artsy ones and whatever. And then uh, the others will come and see all the local bands. And mm. uh, that was basically the concept. I wanted it, it to be more sci-fi. Uh, mm. I had a lot of films lined up. And then at the last minute, the British Film Institute, who I was hiring them off, wouldn't give them to me because they discovered that it was to more than a couple hundred people. And that, so they wouldn't lend them out. So I had to put a few slides up. Uh, talking about Joy Division, I'd put them on quite a few times before the future mm. army. And when I saw, and I haven't really quite got, I thought, yeah, there are a little bit of the doors in there, a little bit of that. And the, but when they were up on that stage uh, in the sort of gloomy hall, oh, so, wow, these are a stadium band. These are a big band. That's, you know, it had like a kind of revelation as well, like yourself, you know, just thought, wow, you know, have a shame, you know, six months later, you know, uh, uh, in Curtis was gone. That, yeah. You know, and, but in a way, you know, it's kind of uh, in its little bubble, isn't it? It's Joy Division in that little bubble. And they couldn't go on to be bland or, do anything daft or whatever. It's there in history, in the history of rock and pop. It's there in legend and made films about them. Mm -hmm. So it, it was uh, an interesting little period. They really suited that that event, really. And I mean, the sound in the Queen's Hall could be very unforgiving. It was quite yeah. echoey and boomy. But with yeah. them, it really worked, you know. And so you got the pounding drums of. The song I, I remember nothing. I remember the, the way the drums sounded. You know, it was like cannons. You know, it's just amazing sound for 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 them. It didn't work so well with Public Image, who were quite disappointing and went off in a bit of a huff, as I remember. They all sat down on the stage, had some kind of discussion, yeah, and then John Lydon turned his back on the audience for most of them. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were a bit edgy, I think, when they came out. They were, they were most of the bands were northern, and they were all come up from southern. They were all a little bit edgy, you know. John McDonald was like herding them around. He didn't like people shouting for Sex Pistol songs either. I don't think very much. <laughs> that was it, you know. That was the uh, that was the thing, you know. How can you move on? But Bobby yeah. managed. It. Well, Lyman managed it. You know, I think uh, that listening to a lot of the early public image stuff, as I have been sort of recently, I think. Uh, they influenced the Smiths a lot, mm. you know, the, the way that the songs are structured and all that. I think mm. the elements in the Smiths' music, you know, that were there in public image. Mm. But that's you, just really incidental. Where, where did you get the idea for a twin stage? Because I've not really seen this at very many things, if ever, actually, again. But there was one stage yeah. to the left and one stage to the right. And as the band on the left finished... The band yeah. on the right would then go on, and so you had Joy Division on the right, Public Image in, Limited on the left, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, but that was just my idea, you know. And the, the firm I was using was Entech, and I talked to them about the possibility of having two desks or a big desk where you could be line checking one band and put the other because I had so many bands that it was kind of like so it would build a long stage and. We we run, run a, a curtain uh, on a run across. That was the idea. Uh, mm. And so you black off one stage and have one stage going on. Then you just pull the curtain across and there's another stage all set up and they go straight into it. Mm. And it was just an idea. But the staging thing on the first one was nearly didn't happen because, uh, you know, I'd booked it with the Queen's Hall. And I think they were slightly worried about having a load of points. And they didn't do anything about the stage. They didn't have a stage the day before. So I had to ring round scaffolding yards. And every, uh, Hughes, fortunately, Hughes, where the timber place was just across from the Queen's Hall. And so I, 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 got, I couldn't get scaffolders to do it, but I did get one or two experienced scaffolders. I got the scaffolding poles and everything, one or two. And then a lot of the F Club members, a lot of the punks came and they sort of helped set it up. Some of them had worked with scaffolders, so they knew a bit. 
So they set it all up, and mm. I got uh, eight by four uh, boards from Useware and painted them black. And I got a load of plastic, which I paid a fortune for last minute, which I stapled on the front of the stage to cover up the uh, uh, the scaffolding. And mm. uh, so it was all black, you know, black plastic. It was all black, you know, black curtains, everything, all me and minimal and whatever. Yeah, it, yeah. It works. So, another, another thing I remember vividly, which again seemed very futuristic to a 15-year-old who'd never been to a gig before, was that uh, Punishment of Luxury had lasers. And years later, because the, 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 they're still going Punishment of Luxury, they're, they're based up in Gateshead as, as they were then. And I interviewed them about 10 years ago, and I, I asked them about this, and they, they borrowed Hawk, Hawkwind's lasers. Hawkwind were on on the Sunday night, and apparently had let them use their lasers to sort of test them out because no one else had lasers in those days. You know, So Hawkwind were like, well, okay, we'll, we'll give them to this band to, to test them. You know, And so they were the lucky... lucky beneficiaries of these like green light shooting things that just look amazing you know well that's wrong for a start they went <laughs> you know, I, I hired them cost me about 1500 quid nobody had lasers then at that time mm -hmm. nobody and I, I just thought they were coming through and the problem with that we got the lasers and it, you had to use pump loads and loads of gallons of water to Cool them down so you could only use them for a short while. Mm. So we saved the last two bands on each night. And uh, Argon and Crips and Red and Green, and they, they did all these geometrical patterns across. Yeah. And they were amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, because nobody used them, nobody objected to them. Two years later, I think Black Sabbath wanted to use them, and Lee's Council wouldn't let them use them because they'd seen that James Bond film with the laser going up to his groin, you know. And, um, <laughs> Dangerous and all, and they abandoned. And so I got away with that one. <laughs> it was very expensive, and it looked really great. And you know, you you had Kevin Cummins there. Like he took some great photos of uh, Joy Division and all that. Tony Wilson asked him one, and uh, he, he didn't stay to take any po uh, any photos of. The later bands of the lasers, and it would have been amazing, you know, to have pictures of the lasers happening. And yeah, it was nothing I just thought would be an interesting sci fi thing, you know, to have lasers now right. they're coming, but and then nobody else would use them. Yeah. yeah, and that's why they were very expensive because there was only one team actually doing them, you know, they'd more or less invented them anyway. And so, uh, that's the fortune. It's funny Hawkwind being on that bill because if you look at the bill now, Hawkwind is the name that stands out as being the you know it's they're like the odd one out, and you, you seem to do that with the early future armors. Like the the following year, which I went to as well, the the second one, you had Gary Glitter on um, alongside Susie and the Banshees and the, the real post punk, you know, the Echo and the Bunny Men, the Fall, all those bands, Clock BVA. Well, you, you know, you can't get too pretentious or too serious. I always put reference to the past in saying this is what you were listening to 10 years ago mm. Hawkwind was, uh, they were like the punks of the day the hippie punks of the day this is mm. what you listened to 10 years ago and this is what has influenced you because you know they're quite an influential band mm. and even like the Gary Glitter thing was like look you know you may be 19 now but you know when you were 9 you were buying Gary Glitter records and it yeah. worked it didn't work with the Bay City Rollers. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, the, the Bay City Rollers one. Um, what, that, that was quite controversial, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, the weird thing, I remember, I remember, I went to that, and I remember they walked through the audience. You know, they yeah. walked through the audience to get on the stage, and I remember thinking, that's the Bay City Rollers. They just walked past me, and it, it just felt it felt really odd. You know, why, why would they have walked through the audience to get on their own stage? <laughs> They, they are really, they, they were really nice lads. Uh, but this, you know, they're making a comeback and they had a, a girl singing with them as well. I think that's what the crowd didn't like because they were trying to do new stuff and mm. I think it would have just been them doing the, uh, the, the hits. You know, they might have got away with it more. They, they were chucking stuff at them. Unfortunately, uh, somebody chucked a can of lager at uh, Les McEwen and he chucked it back and hit a girl. Yeah. Yeah. You know. 
And that was front page of the papers the next day and the sun and all that. So, you know, I got a lot of press coverage for Fusion Madness. So, you know, because it was like a free show, I suppose, for the press. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what are these young reprobates doing now? You know? <laughs> It's, it moved around a bit, didn't it, after that? I mean, the, you know, the, the, it suddenly went to Stafford um, and then to Deeside. Why, why, did, why did it not stay at the Queen's Hall in Leeds? The second one was, was made money, but I put it into making that film, the film of it. You know, I made four half-hour programmes for BBC Two. And yeah. I shafted the film company, so I, didn't, I lost money on that as well. But it was very successful. And I went on holiday. When I come back, uh, John Curd from London, straight music, uh, had booked in a festival himself in September called Days of Future Past. Ripped off, not only ripped off the idea, he ripped off the name. So yeah. I thought, I'm not going to let him steam in like that. So I, I went and did my, my festival at the New Bingley Hall in Stafford uh, with Simple Minds and Bauhaus and Gang of Four and all that. Mm. And the one after that, I did it at the Eastside Leisure Centre with New Order and the Damned and uh, a few other bands, you know, who Icicle Works, not who, who made it afterwards. Um, mm. So, you know, but that was, it wasn't great because it was an ice rink and they put the... It was cold. It was really, it, really cold. It was um, cold to see through, you know. Yeah. It, it wasn't perfect. But then uh, 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 John Curd went bust and... We thought it was available the following year, so uh, I uh, I booked it back into Leeds with a more it was a bit of a more gothy lineup. Yeah, yeah. I think that was coming in in the in the eighty two one, the, the the New Order one. You know, if you it, it was it was New Order, the Dorothy column, but then further down the, the, the what would become, I suppose, the beginnings of goth. I think Dead or Alive were on that bill, um, but not in the You Spin Me type incarnation but a much more kind of like a gothic rock type thing um probably my favorite new order gig actually that one i thought new order were breathtakingly wonderful and it, they really suited again like as in as joy division had suited the queen's all they really suited the the leisure center at d side you know and that, that cold environment for some reason seemed to really suit those songs you know um i i believe that you still owe them about four and a half grand from that gig john is this true uh I owed the money for the gig. I, I sort of paid for her, her rehearsals. Uh, and mm. I got the money together and uh, I, I mortgaged my house to uh, get the Duchess. And, uh, mm. you know, I had the money there. This is going to New Order. Mm. And Alan Watkins, who knew New Order, uh, I rang you up and said, Have you got a contact for Rob Gretton, New Order now? Uh, I want to uh, give him this money. And so he said, yeah, well, give it to me. I'll give it to them. So I gave him the money to give to them. And he called me and said, is it okay if I put this into a Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan tour? And yeah. He said, really? But he did. And, it, and I said, so where's my money, you know, at the end of the tour? And he, because he managed New Order. He went on to manage New Order, do it. He yeah. knew them together. And so it's kind of a morally a, a difficult thing you know do i still owe them i gave them to a guy who was like acting as their manager he put mm. it into fatty ali khan tour and uh, I, I got a sheet of paper off him with oh, just scribbled figures and numbers where all the money had come and it was, it was, it was, it was yeah it was a bad place but i never had uh, enough money in one place to pay them there and then you know, uh, later on, on uh, uh, I was made bankrupt, and mm. in a uh, in a bankruptcy, all your debts are supposed to be written off, so you can't pay anybody. I did offer to promote a tour for them for nothing, but they didn't yeah. take that. But yeah, the the good lads, I, I like them all, you know, and I yeah. uh, got on. It was just one of those things. The the, uh, the D side lost about six grand, you know, uh, as well as that money. Lost a load of money, you know, having to move it, and uh, it was. Uh, it's one of those things that, that uh, I'd like to make right at some point. 
is is it, is it a life that it wouldn't suit everybody, would it? That kind of like the you know the the chance of going bankrupt or what well, you know one minute. May, be, being on in the black and, and the next minute in the red and that constant roller coaster and never really knowing which gig I, I guess you'll you'll have a few bankers but there's, there'll probably be a lot of uncertainty along the way of because because obviously a lot of things happen out of our control as we found out this year for heaven's sake I mean you know the Leeds Festival has been cancelled because of a pandemic nobody would have seen that coming so presumably I don't know about Leeds Festival in particular but there'll be a lot of promoters around the country now who probably lost a lot of money on the, on, the, on the pandemic and there's always those factors i suppose that are going to come in i mean do, do you need us to be a certain kind of person to live like this and to be a promoter yeah i've always lived on the edge you know mm. it's it, uh, it keeps me on my toes you know it's just having to uh what's my next move kind of thing you know the times when i've owed loads of money and there are times uh, you know when i've had money and uh, that's the thing about being a promoter. There's no saying it's like, how does the promoter make a small fortune? It starts mm. with a big fortune. You know, it's, it's that kind <laughs> of thing. And loads of them have gone bust. A lot of, uh, a lot of the promoters like Harvey Goldsmith, John Curdy and all that, they mm. been under limited companies. So basically they could trust the company and then be mm. the up few months later somewhere else. You know, that's how the big ones uh, get by. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a risk-taking business. I wouldn't say it's a gamble. It's a calculated risk. Yeah. You can force, you know, I can foresee whether a band's going to pull or whatever, but you can't foresee, as you say, a pandemic or a mm. flood whatever coming from the side, you know, you know, fortunately I, I've been able to uh, get away with, without any sort of really big disasters. <laughs> the, the, the Futurama, when it, ca it, ca it came back as Futurama 6 in Bradford, and that was, I suppose that really sums it up. The first night, the Friday, was very, very poorly attended, you know, not many people there. And yet the Saturday was absolutely rammed and there were people like James and the Fall and delivering, you know, really, really great sets, you know. And I guess that, that gig sums up the, the roller coaster in, in one event in a way, really. About, about that one was the Queen's Hall was going to be pulled down. And the Evening Post ran a story about what do you want to be the last gig at the Queen's Hall. And a lot of people wrote in saying that they want to see another future armor. So I'd organized that future armor and put it all together and then a month before the gig um the these council said oh yeah uh, to the queen's hall you haven't got a music license so i had to rush down with the manager of the queen's hall to get a, a music license and there were all these people coming up to me saying oh you've got to use the, the staging company i said well i know that staging company is from manchester and it collapsed when they were doing the ream the other month. Uh, I'd rather use the people that I know. Uh, oh, you've got to use show set security. I said, well, I've got my own security who I've always used. They know how to deal with alternative mm. people and all that. And uh, I said, there's security used at the uh, university as well. And, and they chucked it out, you know. And, you know, I had one counselor saying, uh, you know, the bands like Dove Sec, and drug free America on it. And what we can count say, I'm not having people like that running riot in my ward. You know, and it's these are the people you're dealing with, you know. So I, re I remember the Duchess went to a council meeting and uh, uh, about <coughs> the late, uh, the change into the licensing laws and all. I want wanting a later license. And uh, he said, well, you've got all afternoon. Lorna Cohen, she was there at the time. You've got all afternoon. I said, we get the band coming in. We've got to set up. We've got the sound check, so we can't have people in in the afternoon. And so, you know, when the band finished, we'd like to open an extra half hour and all that. And, and she turned around and said, Michael Jackson's not having a sound check at Roundy Park. I said, well, it's a different thing he does, but he's not. He's not. He's just turning out. I said, yeah, but all this crew will be there. They were sound checking the day before, even. 
but it's like they, they don't have an understanding of how these things work. I, I think they probably do these days, you know, because it, there's access to everything on the internet. But in those days, they didn't. You know, those are the people you're dealing with. You, you mentioned Drug Free America. That they were the first band I ever reviewed, and uh, that's what got me taken on by Melody Maker <laughs> by sending yeah. a reviewing of Drug Free America. And then in those days when I was reviewing, you know, two or three times a week, um, most of the gigs that I reviewed were at the Duchess, which of course is the, the venue that you then ran for very many years uh, on, on uh, Bicker Lane. Yeah, so I sort of ran it for uh, uh, three or four years, yeah, and then promote, but I stayed on promoting it for 12 years, yeah. Yeah, it's now, now a Hugo Boss shop, but... Um, so many people played there. You know, that was the place that where you brought people like Oasis, Blur, Radiohead, all to Leeds. Um, and people still talk about the, the Duchess, you know, very, very affectionately. Um, re really the sort of, I suppose it was the brood and L of, of the time where, you know, it was the, the kind of launch pad for so many groups. And, uh, you know, there was a, a, literally a band on every night of the week, you know, in, in a way that is very rare and certainly was then. Um, I guess that's another story, but uh, and we hopefully we will pick that one up in a future episode. But uh, we've only really. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go on, John. I think a venue is uh, as good as its programmer, you know, uh, as the acts it puts on. And I tried to to put a variety of acts on, from blues to punk to glam rock to what folk to comedy, and. Uh, so everybody has uh, a different idea of what the Duchess wants to them. Mm. Well, I uh, hopefully we can pick that up in a, in a future episode. And because there's still a lot of this story to go, I knew we would get to about this point. With you know, I wasn't even sure we'd get past 1981 because there's so much to get in. We've only really touched the surface, but uh, hopefully everyone tuning in uh, has really enjoyed it and 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 has had a an impression of what a remarkable life you've had and what a, an enormous in, impact that you've made on mu music in and around the city. Um, on behalf of everyone that's been to those gigs, I, I think thank you very much, John Keane. Thank you. I made my mind up uh, a long time ago to do something that uh, relies on making people happy, and I hope I have done. What a great note to end on. Thanks very much and thanks everyone for tuning in and thanks uh, Nathan and the Broodnell for putting this on. Uh, it's been very experimental, a new thing, but hopefully it's going to uh, you know, be a regular thing because uh, I've really enjoyed it and I've, I've, hopefully everyone else has too.